Hey, I'm Zach, your host from Heterodox Academy. Welcome back to another episode of Heterodox Out Loud, where we bring you some of the most thought-provoking ideas in higher education today. Political polarization has become a defining feature of modern American social, political, and academic life. Research surrounding the 2020 election from Pew Research Center says that a month before the election, roughly 8 in 10 registered voters in both left and right camps said their differences with the other side were about core American values. And roughly 9 in 10 worried that a victory by their opponents would lead to lasting harm to the United States. So today we meet Eric Smith, Associate Professor of Rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania. He is trying to heal America's deep divisions through, of course, rhetoric and the understanding of discourse. Let's listen to Eric and his piece, A Rhetoric of Common Values. Although the 2020 presidential election is behind us, the contentiousness that accompanied its arrival persists. However, with nowhere to go but forward, Americans would do well to figure out how to coexist. This is a tall order. Bipartisan communication is a difficult but necessary aspect of democracy. Put simply, to reunite America, we must be able to talk across the divide. I will not be the first or last to say that bipartisan dialogue is imperative to America's unification. However, talking to perceived enemies can induce discomfort or even disgust most would rather avoid. Although our discomfort may stem from what we think we know about those with whom we disagree, discovering admirable qualities we didn't know about them might open the door to mutual understanding. In the process, we may discover similarities where we previously only saw differences. To discover these similarities and our common values, we would do well to understand rhetorical concepts like discourse and the values, beliefs, and attitudes that go with them. First, on discourse. As a rhetorician who studies the unifying potential of language, I see the first step toward recognizing common values as the acknowledgement of the social linguistic concept of discourse, spelled with a capital D, to distinguish it from more common understandings of discourse as conversation. Discourses are described by linguist James G. in Literacy, Discourse, and Linguistics as, quote, ways of being in the world or forms of life which integrate words, acts, values, beliefs, attitudes, social identities, as well as gestures, glances, body position, and clothes, end quote. For example, the discourse of traditional academia, which involves an emphasis on objectivity, precision, formal argument, and an acknowledgement of counterarguments, may not go over well in a dive bar in which the discourse not only de-emphasizes such aspects, but frowns upon the pulling of rank. For example, my earlier as a rhetorician statement wouldn't fly. One would do well to know the preferred discourse of a context before attempting to interact. In addition to their relevance to us as individuals, discourses can describe the preferences of whole communities. Each of us is born into a discourse that ultimately shapes us into the people we become, providing us with the appropriate social roles that others within the discourse community will recognize and ideally accept. When we do not recognize others' social roles, as in how they fit into the discourse to which the person abides, we see strangers and outsiders. So, what we consider normal, good, or right depends on the discourse in which we are raised. The fact that a person who may seem crazy within the confines of one discourse, may be considered quite normal in the confines of another, suggests people we deem abnormal may just be abiding by a different normal from the one we prefer. Recognizing the existence of different discourses is important, but insufficient. We must work to find similarities across those differences. So let's look at values, beliefs, and attitudes. Based on G's definition, a discourse with a capital D, consists of a set of, quote, values, beliefs, and attitudes, unquote. 
Those three features may serve as the best bridge between discourses. Often, they share values, beliefs, and attitudes, but differ in the emphases each discourse puts on them. For example, most people, regardless of their respective discourse communities, embrace values like honesty and loyalty, but a discourse may put more emphasis on one than another. For instance, let's say a friend confesses to you that he robbed a bank. If you put more emphasis on loyalty, you will keep your friend's secret and hope that he does not get caught. However, if you put more emphasis on honesty, you may feel obligated to report your friend to the authorities. Both values are good, but they can bump up against each other in certain instances. If we apply this understanding to discourse communities as a whole, we can see how people can interpret the same phenomena differently. Athletes kneeling during the national anthem is appalling to those who embrace what moral foundations theorists would call the values of loyalty and authority, but endearing to those emphasizing values of care and fairness. Both parties may agree that all those values are good, but some are embraced more than others. But so what? Knowing that different discourses exist and that similar values between discourse communities can be emphasized differently doesn't solve the problem of communicative conscientiousness. In order to use these realizations to alleviate societal contentions, we must use our similarities as a foundation for conversation. The philosopher Kenneth Burke used the term identification to describe how to make the best of shared values and promote a sense of commonality. Burke writes that you can persuade a person, quote, only insofar as you can talk his language by speech, gesture, tonality, order, image, attitude, idea, identifying your ways with his, unquote. Put simply, the more one can highlight shared interest, the more likely one is to dialogue effectively. How might this look? Activist Jonathan Smucker suggests utilizing the concept of narrative insurgency, a tactic based on, quote, points of connection, i.e., common ground between their belief system and yours, unquote. This is to say, we should do our best to investigate another's discourse for commonalities and use those commonalities as starting points for communication. In his book, Hegemony How To, A Roadmap for Radicals, Smucker provides an example of narrative insurgency involving an environmental conservationist speaking to a climate change denier who cited creationism as his primary argument. Quote, when speaking to creationists about environmental issues, for example, an effective point of entry might be to emphasize humanity's biblical mandate to care for God's creation. Unquote. This emphasis on common ground instead of disagreement may develop a level of empathy that transcends debate and better ensures dialogue. The possible recognition of one's values in the discourse of others, especially others once deemed as antagonists, is an ideal first step in creative generative dialogue. As long as we can refrain from having it devolve into accusations of hypocrisy, which in this scenario could sound something like, you are a Christian, yet you don't even know your Bible? The narrative insurgency tactic has potential. To sum up, discourse shapes who we are and how we see the world. We can find shared values within our respective discourses and use them as a starting point for dialogue. All this being said, some caveats are in order. First, many people belong to more than one discourse community. For example, someone could belong to a mixed martial arts club and a pacifist club at the same time. Two seemingly disparate groups. What's more, context will determine which discourse community is relevant at a given time. We must not judge the pacifist as a mixed martial artist while he participates in nonviolent protest. Second, I want to be clear that promoting a mode of communication based on commonalities does not mean we should try to ignore differences. Differences enhance diversity, which, in turn, enhances our ability to innovate and move forward in productive ways. Approaching a problem from a range of perspectives provides more viewpoints to choose from or even synthesize, therefore increasing the possibility of finding effective solutions. Ultimately, our goal should be to advance society in ways beneficial to all. Communication is imperative to such goals, and acknowledging shared values 
can help put us on the right track. This will not be easy, but it doesn't really have to be. It only has to be productive. Eric Smith. For more about political polarization from a heterodox perspective, check out our Political Polarization Resource Guide at heterodoxacademy.org. Thanks, as always, to Richard at Davies Content, who produced our podcast. This is Heterodox Out Loud. I'm Zach. Thanks for tuning in.